Hello, Alex. How you doing? Hey, Andy. I'm all right. Thank you. Good to see you as always. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, this session today. I know, me too. We've got this uh, big thing at the university called the, the AI Foundry, which is an AI sort of research network, but also a community of businesses that are thinking about how to make their AI sort of responsible and ready for the next sort of decade of artificial intelligence. So it's fantastic to have our, our guests coming up to talk about these issues. And I know that some of that community is tuning in today to hear what we've got to say. So, so yeah, it's really cool. This is, I think, the fourth one of our disruptive technologies series, isn't it? Yeah, we've we've uh, we've gone through some amazing topics so far, and I think this is this is absolutely critical. This one, isn't it, in terms of uh, you know AI diversity in the future of work? There, there can be no more important topics than this right now. Absolutely, and I think without any further ado, we're going to jump Dan into the stream and say hello to him. Hi, Dan. Oh, hi there. Hi, Dan. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, um, oh, Dan. It's you. a real pleasure to. Uh, I can't think of anyone better to be. Uh, Coming and joining us to talk about this topic right now, and uh, as a kind of co-founder of uh, Flock, you know uh, we've um, we've been working together for a number of years, haven't we? A few different channels from the Salford Uni to uh, the landing at Media City, and uh, as a kind of you know futurist and digital entrepreneur, I've I've kind of uh, been a great admirer of your uh, of your work. So it's a uh, it's brilliant you've been able to join us for this, Dan. Oh, stop it! You are you are a charming fellow. <laughs> I know you're. I, I know what I'm being buttered up, but no, it's a great it's a great joy to be here and hopefully you can uh, you can see me in my uh, home setup as well as uh, as well as on the screen with the slides thanks very yeah, much yeah. sorry I, i'm not i am not in ibiza right now it just happens to be a really sunny day in bolton <laughs> <laughs> you're lying you're remote working it's awesome go go, go on you actually no don't 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 go abroad that would be illegal <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, is it not hashtag not in Dubai? That's the one. <laughs> oh, 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 that's a that is a future of work moment. But there you go. I'll uh, I'll leave it out with my phone. <laughs> so cool. So we're going to hear from you down for a for seventeen minutes. You've told us, so we're going to keep keep our timer on. But it's um it's great to hear you speak about this subject. We're so sort of passionate about it as offered. So we'll perhaps the reins to you for the next fifteen or so minutes, and then we'll jump back in for a conversation afterwards. Does that sound okay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I kind of produce some of the slides, as I say. I do kind of do professional talks for a living as well, So, uh, as well as a bit of a side hustle from uh, yourflock.co.uk, as uh, Alex uh, quite rightly mentioned, which is our little startup, so, uh, which has just got a bit of funding. So, and, and it works around this, but anyway, I mean, this, this is me. We were talking about the uh, AI diversity in the future of work. Hopefully, you can all see the slides as they move on. And if you can't, if any of you guys could give me a quick holler if that's not the case, because uh, I can't see both sides. So there you go. But, um, yeah. but as I say, I teach people uh, quite a lot. But Socrates said this, he said, I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. I can only make them think. Now, Socrates or Socrates, as he's known to me, uh, can say that, then goodness, what chance have I got in, in 17 minutes? But I think it's a really, really important thing, especially when we're talking about artificial intelligence and other things, that it's about thinking in a slightly different way. And that's what I'm hoping today will make you do. It'll make you look at it maybe in a slightly different way, make you think in a different way. Now, a very famous and very rich, um, um, uh, let's say, marketing consultant, that's not true, a management consultant says, start with your why. It's like a chap called Simon Selleck. And he says, start with your why. And the why being, what's your purpose? Why are you here? What's your cause? What's your, what do you believe? And that's what I'm going to talk about today, about my beliefs around the future of work, AI, diversity, and the huge, I mean, and I do mean fundamentally massive implications and potential problems we're going to have in the future if we don't look at it now. So you've always got to start with your why. And the reason why you start with your why is all to do with your, your brain. And people who know me know I'm, I'm really into neuroscience and kind of weird and wonderful things. And, and that's what it's about. It's about looking at um, how you look at the brain. So, for example, you're, you're, I'm not getting too much of the geeky stuff, but the stuff on the top is irrational thinking. The rest of it isn't rational. So you've got to go for your why. You've got to go for your emotions. Yeah. So why am I here? I'm here, hopefully, to make you think in a different way. As Abraham Lincoln said, if I, had a, if I was going to chop down a tree, if I had six hours to do so, I'd spend the first four hours sharpening the axe, which I always think sounds a bit ruder than, uh, than perhaps it, it should be. But there you go. Uh, anyway, so I did a talk a couple of days ago, well, maybe a couple of weeks ago now, um, about the four Cs of the future, the future of tech. Um, and that's what I do. It's, it's who I am. I don't start with a why, I start with a who. Who am I? I'm Dan Sodegrin, and this is what I do as a job. I'm a futurist, as Alex was rightly saying, but also uh, I go on the media a lot and get asked to do stuff, which is cool, which is great, and it has been fun. But it's not my absolute passion. It's not my why. My why is not to become more famous, which is why I've been cutting that stuff down, because my why is about the future of work and changing the future of work. Because I'm all about technology, but I love society more than tech. 
Yeah, tech is awesome and AI and all this stuff, awesome. But if it isn't done with diversity and inclusion involved, it isn't done with tech for good inside it, then we're going to be in a very dark place very, very quickly, a very kind of dystopian kind of place. Um, also, I, I start companies as well. So I started THTC, which is the hemp trading company, which is an ecologically sound fashion label, which is still going. And that maybe kind of shows you that I'm kind of left leaning and a bit of a kind of hippie. Um, had Spearfish, great marketing work, gold minted, but about 10 different companies so far. Some say serial entrepreneur. My mum would say serial failure. She's got a good point because uh, uh, only two of them have got me onto a beach in Mexico, which has always been the plan. And then, of course, you've got yourflock.co.uk, which is what I'm running with Michael, uh, Michael Vishnevsky at the moment. Um, my other clients on the other side of my business, which is great marketing works, um, universities, tech startups, incubators, think tanks, the government, the BBC. These are the people that pay me to do keynote speeches and to talk about stuff like this, which is, I'm very happy to talk to you about it today. Last one I did, I think it was just saying, is for the cooperative, Cooperatives UK. Uh, I'm going to use some of that today as well, but it's really useful to have a bit of a deeper thought, not just around cooperatives and that they could, I think they could be the future of work, by the way powered by AI and things like that. But I'm going to use some of what I was thinking about. And that that talk was about the four C's, as I say. So because I'm a bit of a geek, I like to do things as A, B, C, D, and E. It's a bit of a weird linear thing that I've got going on. And I was just saying to, uh, to Alex, uh, I was up at 3 o'clock in the morning doing this talk, uh, and I just changed it all. So there you go. But anyway, AI, that's what we're here about to talk about today, artificial intelligence. And I purposely picked this very grainy and rather silly image um, because we used to have a rather silly view of artificial intelligence. And, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg and it was, it was a journey to the world where robots dream and desire. I mean, you know, do robots dream, all this kind of stuff. But, but you know, artificial intelligence, massively important. And I say, we can have a very cliched view of artificial intelligence and how important it is. It, it will be one of the 30 technologies of the, the next decade. Of course, it will be. And it's one of the 30. I think it's actually the most important thing. And as the, uh, as the title said, start off, I think it was something like, we've got to get this right, or it's the most important thing, humankind. I did say humankind for a reason, not mankind, but humankind. Humankind have got to get this right. Because if they don't, and this is what uh, the, the guy who runs uh, Google said, AI is, the is probably the most important thing humanity's ever worked on, ever worked on. Yeah, more profound than electricity or fire. I think he might have overdone it with the fire bit, but um, that's up to you. But um, it could, could well be the case. But electricity, maybe the case. Because this is all about the fourth industrial revolution, yeah? And you guys, you know, people on the call, the ladies on the call, you're all clever people. So you know this is the fourth industrial revolution. You know why it's so important. You know why AI is going to be a huge player in this. But we've also got to be a bit careful of what we call the hype curve. Again, the techies and the people on the call will know the hype curve is the bit where people get very excited and then they go, oh, my goodness, it's not going to be like that. And then it's going to be something else. And um, every piece of technology kind of goes to this hype curve. I was had the joy of having an augmented reality company about 12 years ago. So I was way ahead of the hype curve. I was from Australia actually riding the hype curve or the first one of an uh, augmented reality point of view. So we've got to be a bit careful when we start talking about AI, about this hype curve. Yeah. One of the things that business wants to do or business wants to do, business wants to make sure artificial intelligence makes a fortune for them and for, for their businesses, which is why, and I'm very, very proud, by the way, very proud of Pete, um, who, you know, I was about to say personal friends of mine, but, you know, know, know some of them who <laughs> started and things. Anyway, point being is, is that, you know, that company in Manchester, in Greater Manchester, 130 jobs they're going to create, about £17 million investment, maybe actually a bit more now. Now, that's awesome. They're an AI scale-up. That's awesome that we've got these, yeah, but we've got to be careful. When we start talking about AI and all these other things, you can get into this kind of um, BS bingo. I was going to say that differently, but I won't because of the on brand for the university and things. But you know, BS bingo, you've got to be careful that we don't start just ticking stuff off and you know, talking about Elon Musk and open AI and all these different things. Yeah, but I will do. And if I if you had this, uh, if we did it actually live and we did it uh, with you, you could, you could actually have, we could have printed this before. Think about it. You could have signed up. You could have printed this before. You could have played along. This is what I would have done if we did it face to face. But anyway. It is uh, the BS bingo of the next 10 minutes. So AI, AI is going to create a massive change, a huge change. Now, I work for Your Flock. I was one of the co-founders of it. And Your Flock is all about how you can use values to um, basically look at a company's, almost a company's personality, uh, the, the remote teams and seeing how many, what values they share and seeing how effective they'd be together as a group. It's very much about human beings, not about AI. But we will be using machine learning as part of that, your flock, because of a, uh, a bit of money that we got from Innovate UK, will be using machine learning. Yeah, we've also just got a brand new investor. He was actually Stephen Hawkins, former assistant. 
So again, ticking the box for AI BS bingo. Absolutely right. Stephen Hawkins already mentioned. Artificial intelligence already mentioned. Cambridge already mentioned. Excellent. We're all getting into the same kind of area, yeah? Now, why am I talking about it? Because change is hugely important, especially in businesses. So your flock knows that machine learning will be part of it. Machine learning is going to be part of the future. But artificial intelligence, we've got to be really careful that we're not doing this too early, purely on hype. We've got to be really, really careful. You know, we are at the first bit of AI. And I know it's been going for a long time, and I could bore you. I'm sure people on the call all know the history of AI, and you could argue it's not even AI that I'm talking about. You know, But it's... <laughs> It's massively important that we discuss not just the hype cycle of artificial intelligence, yeah, not just the kind of the, the exciting marketing buzz terms around artificial intelligence, but what it means for society and what it will mean. Because what we have to do, we have to start collaborating, uh, collaborating, should I say. How are we going to be, make sure that we're more collaborative? Yeah, obviously, AI is a new technology. Yes, of course it is. And you've got new techniques. I'm going to talk about one which is a couple of years old, and people on the call who know AI well will know. What I most probably guess already what I'm going to be talking about, and it's not just deep mind and open AI and things. But anyway, we've got to start thinking how do we kind of bring about more collaboration as a whole, as a society, not just siloed into tech, but as a society at whole when we're talking about artificial intelligence. Okay. So when we're talking about artificial intelligence, of course it's to do with the other C, which is computers. Now, why would I then talk about computers and then instantly show you a picture of a mill and canals, another C? Um, well, this is it. The water inside the canal powered the mills. I don't know if that's strictly how it worked, but it, this is what I'm saying. This is take, bear with me on this uh, this journey. Um, so the water powers the mills. Now you could get very geeky about the water. You could get really geeky H two O and da 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 and all these fluid dynamics and all sorts of stuff. But as long as you know that water powers the mill, you pretty much got why canals are important. Yeah. So you're looking at something like artificial intelligence, and you start thinking, what can it do? Well, you, you might have already seen this, but you might not. Copy.ai. Have a look. Copy.ai. It is literally taking away the jobs of marketeers and copywriters because it's using AI to do copywriting. Now, people used to think this wasn't possible. A couple of years ago, people used to suffer from madman's dreams. And the reason why it could happen is because, yes, I am going to say GPT-3. I'm sure you all would have guessed that I'd be talking about it. But if you don't know about it, please I mean, don't Google it now. You'll go down a rabbit hole. But you know, but do Google it. Um, it's astounding. It's literally astounding what's happening at the moment with GPT-3. Yeah. Um, if you want to get geeky, you can see the Naval tweets, the tweets that it kind of makes up that that person would say. Um, source AI is a way that it can even start thinking about how it could write code, which is crazy. It can mimic Socrates and have the way that Socrates potentially could have thought about stuff. It is amazing. It can write articles. You all have seen this one done in The Guardian, and then it, it explains. I'll send you these slides. It explains how it, it didn't really write the article, but it kind of did. But more importantly, now a Swedish guy, um, won't say his first name, but Jansen, uh, created a computer program to write Wikipedia articles, and that's now done 2.7 million articles. Okay? So around about 8% of Wikipedia is done now by machines. Now, that should slightly terrify you. Okay? And the reason why it's like terrify is the lack of diversity. I'm going to talk about that in a second. So bear with. Now, you know, we talked about water and we talked about canals and the importance of canals. Now, the reason I'm talking about that is because of data. There's a huge amount of data that this onslaught of data is going to happen. And that's because of all the billions of people that were going to be coming online with fast internet connections. And it will provide huge amounts of data. So huge amounts of water to power, power these AI systems that are going to be out there. Yeah. It's not just going to be that. It's going to be the Internet of Things. It's going to be the crossovers. It's going to be these, these interplays. And I won't get too geeky and passionate about it. But this is where you've got these new moments of entrepreneurship and systems of understanding between Metcalf's Law and Dunbar's number. Now, again, you've been, if you're playing Buzzword Bingo at the moment, you'd have ticked off a couple there as well. Yeah. But this exponential growth in data is where AI's playground is going to be. It's actually it's going to be the oxygen that, that keeps it going, keeps it alive. It's how it changes itself. The reason why it's so important, and I, I love this chap, uh, Volker Hirsch, and if you know Volker, but if you do know Volker Hirsch, go and see some of the stuff he says about AI. He's much cleverer than I am. He does loads of cool stuff with it, yeah. Um, but his point is, is similar to mine. The exponential growth of data and computer dating will create something which is astounding for us to understand, yeah. But my point's are really about society. So who really becomes empowered? So with all this new power, who becomes empowered? Is it the good guys or not so good? And at the moment, you know, we've got to kind of go back to the how. Like, how is it working out? Well, at the moment, diversity is terrible. 
terrible in tech. You even just take gender and private companies, even if you just take gender, it's 11% on the board. Flock, it's 66% of our board and our investors are women. That's just one bit of you know, diversity is gender diversity. It's hugely important. But then you've got, you've got race, you've got religion, you've got age, you've got all these different factors. Now, all this data, it's really important. The reason why it's so important is because they are the barriers. They are almost like the filter system that makes this data happen. So if you have non-diverse boards, and believe you me, look at the numbers, it's tremendously non-diverse. You know, not just from a gender point of view, but from a race point of view. Yeah, it's just awful out there at the moment. If you look into tech, it's even worse. Yeah, so if you look into tech and you look at, I don't know, let's have a look for just the, the one there. Um, let's go. We go for Google. It's probably one of the leaders in AI systems at the moment. Let's go Google. Sixty um, percent are white, thirty-four percent are Asian, one percent are black of the, the people that work there. Now, you might think, oh well, so what? But it's hugely important because if you're working on AI projects and you don't have fame representation you do not have women on the board you do not have people in senior positions who are of different races and different religions you lack the data for the ai system to make decent decisions because you don't even think about it so you then get facial recognition systems that literally don't pick up black faces you know it's awful they, the, you know i was, I was going to i don't have time said i was going to talk about the fact we need more women in tech because the tech needs to be better and believe me we need more women in ai because the ai needs to be better and i'll show you why in this last bit and bear with me for like three minutes because it's all it is but the ethics behind this is hugely important yeah because at the moment gpt3 is sexist because of the data it was given it is sexist at the moment google's translate bot even though they pumped in loads of ai and they have the resources of google it is still sexist and how do i know you just look at the data this literally came out today filipino language is gender neutral but when you actually look at what it says when it translates it it becomes sexist now that is terrible. That's like the basics of gender. Basic, sorry, the basic. What well, is the basics of gender? But also the basics of diversity. You know, it's insane that we're having these AI systems that are profoundly sexist and profoundly racist and profoundly everythingist, but to the nth degree. And we've got to stop it. We've got to stop it now. This has now become a political thing, and it's a bit of a you know soapbox, as you might have heard a sense there. But you know, it's hugely important. It's now become a Congress issue, but it should be a political issue. We should be telling the RMPs because they won't do anything for years and then it will be too late. Great example. This lady here basically told Google, I think the AI machine might be a bit racist. She was fired. Awesome, right? Uh, Twitter's Microsoft bot, uh, the AI chat bot, became racist in a day because of all the stuff on Twitter. You know, garbage in, garbage out. Give it the data. Data is going to be racist. Okay, it becomes racist. It's, this is happening now. This is literally today. Um, actually, sorry, it's about a week ago, but it's all I found it today. Um, the couriers say Uber's racist facial recognition or identification tag got them fired. Their tech doesn't pick up their faces and therefore it got them fired. So this is why I talk about it and I get so passionate about it because in the future, it's not going to be a question of are the computers going to take over the world? Are they going to take over my job? The answer is most probably, yes, they're most probably going to take over lots of jobs. Just like when people left the field and they went into uh, they went into factories, it's just that industrial revolution. It's what's going to happen, yeah. But my point, it's really important. And by the way, if you're worried about it, you can go to a great website. I'll send you the link, and you can enter in your job, and it'll work out a percentage. Uh, hopefully, with AI, that works out a percentage of if the computers will take your job. But anyway, um, you can do this. But this is the thing: the AI systems are going to be picking people that they can recruit, so to speak. They're going to use it in recruitment now. Even on this, even with this image, you can see here, can you see what's wrong with the image? Just all white blokes. I mean, even the image is sexist and racist. I mean, it's just nuts. And that's going to be an advert for it. Amazon scrapped their own AI system because they realized that as a recruitment tool, AI was biased. It was sexist. They had to scrap it. That's Amazon with all that money. Yeah. AI powered recruitment is most probably going to be racist and sexist for a while because of the lack of diversity in the data and the lack of diversity in the people that are making it. So they're taking all this water, but they're taking it from a polluted source. And it's so important because the future of the world, and the future of work will be decided by AI. And what I'm saying is not yet. Okay, Don't let it happen yet. Put the human back in human resources. You know, get people based on their values. Yeah, And you might think, well, wait a minute, Dad. You just told us your flock got this money from the government to be innovative and to work with machine learning. Yeah, it did. But what we're doing is we're creating activities and the computer will pick out the best activities based on your psychological and your flock profile for you to develop as a person. It's not picking you out of a load of people and being sexist or racist. It's the opposite. People can then recruit based on diversity. 
That's really important because this next bit of remote work, this next leap that we're going to have when people can remote work will mean that we can become more diverse. We can become more more inclusive. We can become, we can have a quality. All these things can happen, but they can only happen if we let them. So, you know, I'm going to wax lyrical for 10 seconds about Flock. That's why I love Flock so much, why I invested in it, why I also now work there as well. And we are recruiting on a diverse way. And it's just awesome to be part of something that can help people not only remote work and better teams, but also hopefully make society better too. And I suppose that's my why. So I'm going to finish with my why. My why is trying to make the world a better place with your flock and to make the future world a better place. I'm hoping you can also see and feel why AI shouldn't necessarily be stopped, but we should definitely be thinking about what we're going to do next. Because as Socrates says, can't teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. And hopefully you can think a bit more about that as we have a chat. Thanks so much. Dan, that's been incredible. And I'm just going to get you we're all back in the chat. But that was, wow, what a whirlwind, Alex. Amazing. And some, some, we had some great comments there as well, but uh, some really interesting thoughts there, Dan, and uh, plenty of food for thought there. I've made a bunch of uh, bunch of notes as well, and I'm certainly be watching this back later as well. So that's like kind of like a, you're, you're kind of like a whirlwind of knowledge, Dan, but um, so much, so much came through just in that short time, I think. Well, my, my apologies that it was a bit quick. As I say, we did change the format a bit. Sorry, Jack. Mm. No, uh, no, it's, I, it was it was great. Lots of ideas and lots of things to kind of mull over and rewatch. I think as well. But uh, you make some really powerful points here, and and you know, probably you know, for a lot of us, we, we've been kind of aware of these issues, but clearly, you know, there's there are some major major issues and major challenges here as well. So, in terms of. Um, I just wondered what your your thoughts are on on these kind of um, you know how we might sort of rework some of these dynamics as well. Like what what do we need to do as a society in order to to kind of you know try and rebalance things? Well, I mean, some of the work that I'm doing with the uh, Manchester uh, Publicity Association with the the big idea, hence that little slide at the end with the hashtag the big idea. Uh, we've got 16 of us together, all use Flock to kind of amalgamate the team. So if we're the you know, great team together, which is all, all highly aligned, which is values-wise. Anyway, and uh, and we're all going out and telling people about diversity in tech. And we're kind of saying not only in tech, but also in creativity. And I know University of Salford's very strong on this. Uh, you know, it's one of the things. But I'll be honest with you, it's not about me and you going out and saying stuff. Yeah, and it's, it's sadly, it's gone past that. You know, we've got to go past the why. Why should we have diversity in tech? Well, because otherwise it's going to be awful. We should know that now. Why should we have gender equality? Well, we should know that now, shouldn't we? I mean, if you have to explain that, we're all in trouble. Yeah. But the actual thing is how and how do you do it? And the answer actually is real simple. It's radical simplicity. You just hit them where it hurts. It's you just economically damage companies if they aren't diverse. Hmm. It's not complicated. It really isn't. But, but the thing is, people make it complicated because they say, well, that's not possible because there aren't enough women in tech. Well, there are. Go to tech returners. You know, there's lots of people. You know, if you put, if the money, gets put behind the right initiatives there will be enough women in tech it's not because women don't like computers it's not because women don't like esports that's ridiculous you know it's like oh yes the, oh they don't like computer games mm, okay son i think you're nine you know from the 1940s i think that's a rather sad because yeah. that's the case isn't it you know black people don't like don't like gaming really where did you get that from this is ridiculous it's just nonsense yeah but of course old school power bases want you to believe nothing can be done because why would they want anything to be done? Like old men at the moment are sitting, they're the only, they're, like literally from a remote work point of view, and I'll try not to wax too lyrical about it. People forget the political element of the office. Yeah, they forget that it came from factories. And then factories have an office for the clever people who aren't in the factory. The clever people who sit in the office, they're the managers sit in the office. And then that became its own thing, didn't it? Because information became power, power became king, da da da, information. And then we had loads of offices, everyone had offices. Yeah. Same power dynamic. Same power dynamic, though, but now we have thousands of offices. So all of a sudden, you don't have offices. And the people who want you to come back to the office are the very same people that hold the power in the office. That's all it is. Get back into the factories. Why? Um, just because you should, because we can't make money like this. But we are doing, and we're more productive. Yeah, but I don't have my power. You know, and it, it's just a power play. You, if you want to get more black people in tech, it's very simple. You say you have to employ 10% of people in your company that are black. Yeah. When you run out of people you can employ, come back to me and say, oh, we ran out. And I'll cry. I'll go, oh, my God, that's so amazing. I, you know, you will be welcome with open arms forever. And I'll find you more black because by that time, more black people will be going, oh, I think I can do this. Or old people in tech. You know, it's diversity. It's not about black or women. It's about yeah. old people, neurodiversity. It's everything. It's everything you think. Now, 
remote work allows us to do this, but it can't do it by just hoping that companies are good because companies inherently aren't good because mm -hmm. they're profit driven. So it's like saying, oh, what would you rather do, pollute the ocean or make money? Well, we, we know the answer because mm -hmm. they polluted the oceans for, <laughs> for, for 45 years or something. You know. So would you rather make society more diverse? There's no profit. Well, actually, the irony is there is a profit motive to do it, if you know the stats on it. But it's about your, if you have a diverse board, you make about 19% more money as a tech company. So even the, so even the economic moments don't make any sense why it doesn't happen. So it has to be psychological and it has to be power people and they have to be stopped. And the only way you stop them is with law. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, uh, it's really interesting points. Um, I'm not also, I mean, some of the students will be, will be following this as well. And obviously that, you know, they'll be graduating over the next year or two, you know, what would your advice be, uh, you know, to them? Cause obviously you mentioned about, uh, you know, robots taking your jobs for example you know so what 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 should our what should our students be focusing on in their final years and, and beyond graduation for kind of job roles coming up you know it's like andy said a, a few weeks ago it's in some ways perhaps our duty of educators to be um you know preparing students for the not the jobs of right now but the jobs in five years so how 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 can kind of current students um you know a, a, adapt to that sort of idea of um you know robots taking your jobs as you as you mentioned well, you know, we've got to be really careful with words as well. I think what Andy was saying is absolutely wise. The thing is that the jobs in 2030, we won't know half of them because they won't, they don't exist. And that, that's yep. just what's going to happen. So you, you're asking in, you're asking in probability, aren't you? So you're saying, how do we make them the jobs that we don't know exist yet? Yeah. Like I, I could never have guessed that the, an, N, an NFT meme generator is going to make you, you know, 40 million pounds. Like, just no idea because that didn't even happen six months ago. It doesn't make any freaking sense. Yeah. I couldn't have said, oh, I mean, I'm telling my daughter at the moment, go make Roblox games because Roblox is the future of the metaverse. So just make games. I bought shares in it the other day. Smashed it. Didn't I? Oh, ooh, yeah. Anyway, I uh, bought them too late, but that's not the point. But, you know, but this is the future of the world. Now it is. But, you know, it's a bit like when I was young and people would say, oh, I want to be a lawyer. But then later on, it was, I want to be a graphic designer or a computer programmer. And then it became, I want to be a YouTube star. And then it became, you know, it's just, what you have to do at universities, and I get told off for this all the time, is you have to teach them the soft skills because what computers can't do is empathize. They can't create from nothing. They can't collaborate very well. Well, actually, they're getting better at collaborating, which is scary. Um, you know, you wouldn't think they could create their own computer languages, but they do now, and they have to be turned off because it's so bloody good. The guys who made it didn't even know that it was doing it. I mean, that's, that's a lovely... I could talk to you about for days about that scary reality. I mean, it technically... Anyway... Um, so to answer your question, they need to be teaching people much more the soft skills, which we horribly call soft skills, which never be called soft skills. They're all the hard skills. And I think in the future, and I'm talking about in the next five years, it will be how you get on with people and what you're passionate about. That will drive how, because you'll be able to learn everything else almost on the job, because mm. uh, it will be lifelong learning. So student, I'm sure that Andy's saying the same thing as I am, is you know, you've got to teach them to love learning because yeah. they're going to be learning forever. We've got a couple of questions in the stream already. I think one relates to, or a couple relate to Flock specifically, Dan, if you're happy to answer those. So we've got someone on yeah. YouTube that asks, who's creating your machine learning? What data do you use to train algorithms? Who audits them? And then if, sort of supplementary questions about sort of data protection and and how, what you do with the data that you acquire. So there's a bit more about it's, 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 under it's, the hood. What, I lo I'm loving the question, Tony, because I don't know if I know the person who's asked it. Um, but I do love <laughs> the question because uh, they... I'd love to be able to answer it properly because I can't because of an NDA. So I mean, <laughs> but, but you know, I mean, you'll, you'll, you will know and rightly so that data scientists and for the very things you're just talking about are very protective over their real thing. I can tell you that ethics are a massive part of this. And I can tell you that part of the contract is around the ethical framework and we have to abide by that. Now we put yeah. that in, you know, we didn't have to put that in. So I can't tell you the name of the company and all the individuals that we're working with, but I can tell you they are, we pick them based on their flock values, obviously, because they have to align with our flock values, but also on their ethical values, because we've got to walk the walk. Um, the data protection side of things, I would like us to, I've got to be careful words here. The data that we're using at flock is not particularly, it's not psychometric testing. Yeah, it's, I, it's not particularly dangerous outside of the flock environment, yeah. What you do, you pick your nine core, well, the machine has to ask you a load of questions. You get your nine core values. It picks out your main core value and then basically trains you. Let's say you need to be more caring 
to be in to be in Salford, uh, to be in the University of Salford. Let's say everyone in the University of Salford did it. Awesome. You then work out University of Salford's personality. Now the guys working in uh, gaming and esports might be different to the guys working in accounting and teaching accounting. Not saying you would be, Andy. Just saying you could be. Uh, <laughs> uh, you then work out the teams, and then you think, okay, if I'm going to recruit someone, I'm going to base it on. I don't know, let's say the esporting the lads are all about autonomy and caring. Or you have to get someone, get a girl who's work, who's like that, and that's so it's not it's not like credit card data or all the rest of it's blind. It's not done on age or race or sex. It's purely done on values, and that's why I believe in it so much because it's done on your values, which is self reported. It's not oh I don't know how to say your name, therefore I don't really like you, therefore I'm going to say no to the HR process because I have an unconscious bias in my brain about I don't want to ever look stupid, but your name makes me feel weird. Yeah, you know, that's how because that's how human beings work, man. It's appalling. But just imagine, but think about it. Imagine an ATS system because this is actually happening now. Imagine a recruitment process system. It's happening right now. It goes through your thing, and if you don't put full stops in the right places, it believe it triggers a red flag. Yeah, mm. and even worse, because it triggers the red flag, it could start triggering red flags based on English being a second language because you haven't done it correctly to that. Now that then becomes a self fulfilling prophecy because then. You know, the more and more people at highs like that, therefore the better it is. You get a, the gene pools is twenty times worse. It's a thousand <laughs> times worse because you've got a recruitment bit of software which is based on a racist AI system. Yeah, but it doesn't even understand it because it's the second and third consequence. It's not racist, but it is. Mm. But the data was racist that it put in in the first place. I mean, it's you know, you don't want my anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, I get a bit cross. <laughs> so, so, if people, so if you ask people their values and their values are racist then do you end up with a system that is perpetuating <laughs> these, these perspectives? Well, well, this is the this is the double iron of your flock. What your flock does, it asks things around teamwork and about autonomy and around these nine values, yeah? So it's not mm -hmm. values as, you know, like mm -hmm. racist value. But you could yeah. have a, a group of racist people who are love teamwork. Yeah, and flock would never, <laughs> wouldn't, be able to, wouldn't be able to tell you. They'd just go, oh, they all like teamwork. They must be aligned, you know? Um, <laughs> and I'm afraid I'm not going to touch that with a barge pole. <laughs> 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 we have got some related questions coming out. I want to bring this one up from Maxwell, who said, uh, and you touched on this a moment ago, but how do you teach AI empathy or other human characteristics? Is it possible? Mm. Yeah, really tricky. Yeah, I'm going to say, I, I'd love to be able to say it's not possible, but that simply isn't true. It is possible. <laughs> it will be possible because everything is, because you go quantum computing and everything else. I mean, it's just, you got to remember, human emotions are just chemicals inside your brain. They're not. Mm. There's nothing spiritual. I'm afraid there mm. isn't. You just because you can change it. You can just literally you could wear things. But I look at something called the Lord's helmet. I think it's called or God helmet. And all it does is it just puts mm. electrics through your brain here, and you think God's in the room. Yeah, it just it basically just shuts off a bit of your brain, and you think God's in the room or a devil, depending on your personality type. Now, that alone is, is terrifying, you know, because that basically we are all hardwired the same. Now, can you mm. hardwire a computer to have collaborative thoughts with another computer? And then be empathetic towards that computer not now mm. but there's no way that it can't do that but then if you're thinking should my question is should you teach it empathy and at some point i don't i'm not sure we should because <laughs> empathy is the good side of non-empathy and you know <laughs> like this yeah. stuff i'm a bit worried about i'd like to just keep it in a little bit more of a box for now because it's a bit mm. like you know if we do create a singularity and believe me people think we're a lot nearer than, than you know think we're very close that yeah. is that is potentially problematical for all of humankind. Now, I, I would have uh, on the slides, I took it out in the end. But e Elon Musk stuff, you know, the thing is, he's saying, no wonder he wants to leave to Mars. I mean, fair enough. It's, you know, anyway, you know, fair, <laughs> anyway, you know, and the chat that Google says, he actually says that we've actually got to start looking at AI and making sure that we can control it. Now, I'm not sure they want to control it for non-profit driven motives mm -hmm. or society's motives. It's most probably Google's motive. And their whole don't be evil, you know, they seem to be getting pretty close. <laughs> Sorry, Google. Uh, they did some great work with, with Demis Hablis, and uh, he's a friend of Tom Old. So I should, I'll backtrack. Google are lovely. Uh, no problem that bit. I don't think we can teach computers empathy or robots empathy yet, and I don't think we should. Interesting. I mean, it's funny. So if I can come in, Alex, because I think uh, given that we're sort of talking about the future of work as well, I sort of reflect mm. back on when I visited Google in, in the USA a few years ago, I think that the idea of Google's kind of campus has mm. sort of created this sense of what the what the sort of ideal workplace should be. Mm. And, and I wonder what your sort of thoughts are in terms of what's happened over the last 12 months, more people working from home. Do you feel that we are more sort of vulnerable to, I, I guess, problematic work workplace 
ethics or principles than we were when we were back in the office? Do you think we need to return to that physical location or or is it something that we can sort of say goodbye to? Well, I, I don't I think we've got to be really careful when we use some of those words, which is fine for you to do. As I, you know, I, I hear you and I verify your experience and I'm totally with you. Um, there is a I get doubled off for this, but there is a kind of Bourneville esque. If you can you remember how chocolate companies used to have whole factories and then whole villages? And then mm, you yeah. from cradle to grave, that thing. And I, and I know some of the companies in Manchester had a similar kind of view, and some of them are big mm. enough to do so, and I'm sure Google would be. Now, you know, like military bases, you know, like that kind mm. of idea with a church there, you know, you've got to be careful because that, you do that, and human beings will lap it up because that's mm. what they love, because human beings love mm. that, except you could create a massive problem for yourself because it will get, it could get pretty dark, it gets pretty cult like very quickly. So we've got to be careful that we don't make a cult of work. Your other question about remote work, I think it's absolutely fascinating. I've been remote working for 10 years myself, but, and I obviously never knew that COVID would do this. This is the, you know, that's the old joke, isn't it? You know, what, what created digital transformation in your company? Was it the CEO, the CTO, or COVID? And the answer is obviously COVID, because, you know, 10 years of digital transformations happen in a year. Yeah. We went from 4% of people remote working to now something like 96% want to. Mm. Now, that's insane. That's a social shift that will be it's huge. Even if 50% of people remote work, that is still 10 times more than work, mm. which is a huge change. I mean, it, it destroys yeah. offices. It gets them good because we don't need so many offices. You know, remember, we don't need them. They just exist. We built them. You can unbuild them. You know, city centers don't have to have so many people are like, oh, Thornton's is gone. Good. Put a park there. You know what I mean? Put some green space in places. Why? Because it's nice because we need bees more than we need bloody shops. That's just the way the world is, yeah? So the future of work, to answer your question, I think it's going to be a hybrid. And I think it's going to be much more to do with people popping back to the office like you would pop into you know, like a marketplace. And so you all meet on a Friday and you all have a chat. Mm. Because you'll still need human connection. You won't ever get rid of that. You'll still need, as you say, to kind of almost forewarn yourself against the bad things that might happen, but also you know became the good things that are happening and still give people hugs for crying out loud and have dinner with them and great bread and things you know for human beings for god's sake you know we'll need it but i can guarantee you if you want a productive company you will not hire people that are because everyone's open to remote work you will not get the best people in your company if you're saying get back to the office yes. that's a very dangerous gambit very dangerous and what you what the thing that really breaks my heart is that companies are are saying get back to the office and even when they don't you know even though they don't they're not they're not giving enough technology into the space where the office, you know, the offices cost a lot of money. Yeah, like literally 2,000 pounds per person, yeah? And then they're like, oh, we'll just all use Zoom. Oh, cheers. You know, if that's it, is it? We just all get Zoom and, a, and maybe get a <laughs> check. You just save two grand, you know, where's them? Oh, we're making loads of money. What well, is the reason you haven't supported us even slightly? You know, mental health concerns. Are we, you know, this is one of the biggest things about your flock. Your flock will identify whether you share the same values and people who share the same values work together better. Mm. What you'll find in the office now is when we lose the office, that cultural hub spot, we lose it, we lose that glue almost that forced us all together. People won't be wanting to work together as much because they'll realize they didn't like those people and they didn't like the company. And that's why productivity in the UK, it costs us something like 34 billion pounds a year through lack of productivity because people don't like working in where they work. Mm. And they won't do that now because you could work for anyone, anywhere, almost for I know, fifty percent of our jobs. I know that we can't with bars. I get that. I, I'm not. I'm talking really about office workers. I know that's a little bit, you know, elitist of me. And it's not meant to be. I understand <laughs> construction can't be done by much. Well, even three D printing, for God's sake, construction could be done by computers. I mean, come on. Anyway, sorry. I was talk, <laughs> talking to a kind of digital entrepreneur yesterday, and he said we can't carry on working from home. It's ridiculous. I've got staff that are in kind of one bedroom flats in london and they can't leave and all the rest of it so there's perhaps um it's a it's a challenge it's definitely raised a lot of questions hasn't it but is there much to be said in the kind of those kind of water cooler moments or perhaps people you know if you've got a kind of bigger house and you're a bit more experienced and so forth are you perhaps in a better position in terms of the future of work than somebody who's kind of newer to the industry or living in a smaller space or has got a ropey connection for example no, absolutely. And I think 3% of the people, and I, I'm one of them, by the way, that worry about my broadband connection because my daughter's on Roblox and she's watching Netflix at the same time. Most of the time, I, I get wiped out half of doing a, doing a talk for the BBC. Or it's, it's quite embarrassing, to be fair. But there we go. That's the point. Um, but it's about 3% of people that worry about that kind of stuff. And again, you can look at the data. Um, you were very clever, but slightly cheeky because you asked two questions there and then you folded <laughs> into one. Very good. <laughs> so the water cooler moment, which is the thing that everyone talks about, it's like we lose the serendipity of the moment because of whatever. You don't. It's just the fact you're not using technology right. Yeah, because not everything okay. has to be a Zoom call. 
Yeah, and yep. this thing called Hopin, which is now why Hopin's worth 60 times more than it was. You know, there's mm. loads of pieces of tech you should be looking at and using, by the way, not going, oh, right. it's a bit rubbish. Now, the other one is we're, we're not remote working. We're living through a global pandemic, which forces us to lock down. Yep. They are fundamentally different things. Okay? Mm -hmm. now, when that stops and you can go outside and hug a friend and get a coffee and then go back and do some more work, believe yep. me, people living in one bedroom flat can have a time of lives. Yeah. Now, or yep. they're not. And if they're not, that's fine because buy them a desk, buy them a nice chair, get them a nice yep. camera because you're saving two grand a year. So you get them yep. something nice. Go and, you know, send them a bottle of wine. I'm not, sorry, not drinking culture, but send them something every week as a little hamper for being lovely. Whatever you want to do, you can cheer people up in lots of different ways. It does make me smile, though. And it's right to do. And we should be, because 20% of people, and this increases if you're younger, say they're lonely working from home. But we've got to remember, this is working from home during a pandemic. This is not normal. Yeah. It won't be normal. Yeah. But believe me, we won't go back to the old normal, because that wasn't normal either, because that was forcing everyone to live together who hated each other in a small office space. <laughs> uh, We've got another point. Point. We've got another question from Wasim as part of our network, and he's asked whether you can envisage the writing of fiction and movie scripts uh, by AI. So rather than having creators writing, we'll have the machines creating this work. And since you mentioned copy AI, I wonder whether you think that expands into fiction. Uh, I mean, I, just go and try copy AI. Seriously, yeah. just go and try it. Yeah, just go now and go and try copy AI. You get seven weeks for free. Go and try it. Yeah, if you've got a website and you want to write some copy, Go and just, in fact, just make a website. Do it this afternoon. Go to, you know, go to WordPress, make a website. Write about anything, yeah, and get this thing to write it for you. It's in this, you will not be able to tell the difference. You'll literally, you'll pick maybe one, two, or three bits. Of, so you might go, oh, that's a bit rubbish. But you're saying that's a bit rubbish. You're not saying that's, that's done by a computer. It's just that's not very good. It's awesome. It's absolutely standard. Now, all that's doing is taking one bit of software, Transformer, and another bit, another bit, bring it all together. Now, to answer your question, you can Google, easily Google that. Um, yeah, they, uh, AI is already making adverts been making adverts for years. Uh, AI beats copywritten advertising, uh, digital marketing advertising. Uh, the digital marketing, in fact, as a, as a basic idea will be replaced with AI in at least, I think, within two years, because mm. there's no way human beings can do it at the pace that an AI bot can do it. Now, you know, there's an argument about the subtleties and nuances, but no, it's not. It's just data. Yeah. So if you've got all the right data, you have the right marketing message, programmatic buying it at the same time with different paper click with different keywords, I mean, I try to, I try to build, I try the, uh, the irony and the arrogance of me. I tried to build this about three years ago and wonder why I couldn't build it. I mean, <laughs> I tried to build this whole system and I was like, oh, that's quite, that's quite hard work. Yeah, I can't do that. It's insane. I had, I had one developer, this poor guy was crying at the end of it because it's just too complicated. But I mean, but you look into that, you know, so you're as a job as a marketeer and a job as a creative, by the way, would be how do you manage this tech stack that you have, which will be mainly driven by AI. And then you'll basically be the curator of this creative right. experience, and that's how it'll work. Now, you haven't even talked about deep fakes because then thank God that you didn't, because we're talking about for another hour. But you know, when you start looking at deep fakes and how that's done with AI, the whole bloody world changes because you all you need you don't even need Nicolas Cage anymore. <laughs> Sorry, Nicolas Cage. Of course you do. I'm joking, but I think there'll be. Um, if you look at the works of fiction that are done by AI at the moment, they're rubbish. Um, but that's now, you know. But in a year. Yeah. You know, I think they'll be okay. In two, they'll be good. And three, they'll take over. You know, you look at the, I mean, the Wikipedia articles are a great example. Eight, you know, it's it's eight point seven percent of Wikipedia is now written by an AI bot. Yeah, and you've got That's, kind of I mean, AI AI powered social media influencers and things like that. You kind of you know virtual. They're already here, by the way. I mean, you're you're yep. both clever enough to know that's the case. So. <laughs> that's, that's half yep. of social media, I think. <laughs> it's how the Russians did. No, no, sorry, that was a bit rude. Wasn't saying the Russians did it. It's how other states might do it. I didn't mean the Russians. But if you look at the, I did this for a television program. It was fascinating. It's the only bit that was cut, and rightly so, it was slightly substantiated. But there's whole farms that you, that do this kind of stuff. But you replace that with a computer doing it. It's actually easier. The computer does it, and it does it without any emotion. That's the worst thing about AI. It will do it to the nth degree, not even knowing it's racist. So it won't even regret it. It will just do it and just keep doing it. But there you go. Sorry. It's interesting because I think a lot of these conversations often kind of compare the best fiction to what AI can do. But of course, there's lots of oh, really yeah. terrible fiction that uh, computers are perfectly capable of replicating, I think, already. So we sort of try to make this comparison, which perhaps isn't yeah. really the relevant you know, point. And half, and half of marketing, because everything's so bite-sized, you know, can, yeah. can a deep fake make a TikTok video go viral? Well, that's, <laughs> that, that'll be happening tomorrow. You know? yeah. And then you'll have the question, can it do that 
and it's a tweet. And if this is the fascinating thing, if it's a tweet and then they sell it, who owns it? Mm. Yep. Isn't that fun, isn't it? Then you start thinking about yeah. do do AI systems have human rights? Yeah. They're really yeah. interesting. And that's fascinating. That, that is fascinating. I mean it's completely completely pointless and moot, but it's fascinating conversation. For the future of work, it will it will be almost like you'll have to tax robots because they'll do so much work. Mm. And that's how we we'll have to do it. And this is the you know the future of work will be not working very much and getting universal basic income. I said that a couple mm. of years ago on BBC and I was pretty much laughed out off the breakfast sofa. But that's where we're gonna go because that's you know after furlough, what they're gonna do, you know a lot of people aren't going to have a job and they, they can't all be on the you know they can't be on benefits and otherwise we'll it'll get dark very quickly with the rise of populism ha <laughs> <laughs> ha there you go that was a good rant at the end wasn't it <laughs> well, really well, so I've, got, I've got i've got one final question which oh. is, is coming from anna who's uh, looking at this via linkedin so she's whatsapp me a question which is about recruitment uh, and whether com companies that are using AI to read CVs and automatically dismiss applicants based on missing core words in the advert, you know, what are the implications of this? Can you envisage a situation where AI is essentially driving human resource decisions and whether that may lead to actually a more detrimental workplace? It's, it's, a, it's exactly my proposition. Absolutely yeah. that. Yeah. So thank you very much for the, uh, the obvious uh, AI bot that listened in and then uh, then <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm sure you're a human. You're a human person. I was just a silly joke for me. Um, the yeah, the, the the answer is yeah. That's exactly what's that's happening now. This is why it's scary. You know, it's not in the future. This will happen. This is happening right now. It's happened to. My bigger question is, will people be able to sue on the basis of a warped mm. algorithm? Now that's that's a, because you you should be able to because just exactly the same as if an HR manager is sexist, that should not be allowed. Well, I'm afraid recruitment companies right now, without even considering it, are using racist and sexist software because they don't understand that AI is because of the data that it got. It's not AI's fault. It's the data that it got in. It's polluted data, polluted outcome. And then what happens is everyone goes, oh, well, you can't blame the machine. Well, <laughs> but I can blame you for using the machine. <laughs> It's like, oh, can't blame people for coal-powered stations. Uh, no, we can, actually. That's quite important. Why don't we all use solar power? Well, well, we've got all this coal. I don't care. You should all start using solar. But that's the point. So we've got to really be careful, especially in recruitment, because recruitment can be quite... <laughs> recruitment isn't very diverse already. Mm. You look at the people who are in recruitment. That's a big issue. Now, mm. that's diversity. That lacks diversity. Then you have on top of that, a non-tech background in recruitment, and I'm not being rude to the recruiters, then you have SaaS companies that want to make money, absolutely, but don't necessarily care about the AI ethics of how they got there, or they don't even understand that, and they only care about outcomes. And the outcomes are, we recruited people. It's not we recruited people, and the company's a better company, and it's a better society. And that's what I'm saying about the law. The law has to change, because companies won't. Recruitment companies certainly won't. Tech companies won't. And even companies that are recruiting people most probably won't because in the speed to want to recruit people, they've got an economic imperative. You have to legally say, no, you have to have quotas. You have to have a quota of these people. And then you go, oh, how do we do that? And then they'll find suppliers that will help them do that. And there you go. So hopefully that, that at least helps. I'm just looking at the time and realizing that time is. Yeah. Wow. We've covered so much ground, though. And it's been fantastic to have you have you here with us, Dan. And uh, you have been blown away by how much we've covered. But uh, we unfortunately are out of time. And uh, yeah, we've got to sign off. Alex, where do we leave this? Well, I think I think Dan summarized that pretty neatly. We, we have, um, you know, we've covered loads of ground there, Dan. And thanks so much uh, for your time and, and expertise there, Dan. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again at some stage. But so some massive food for thought there and uh again really appreciate your time and expertise dan no no yeah. happy, happy to do it and if anyone would like to have a look and have a go i, di I didn't create a special link which i should have done a bit naughty of me i'll yeah. have a chat with the uh, with people in the tech thing but i'll create a special link for you so then people can use flock at least for free until we go into stealth which is in april so at least they can have a bit of a look around and have a bit of a play with it uh, so you can do it for your teams at the very least I can do, and I, I'm a bit remiss that I should have done that before. But of course, I'm not an AI system, so I just simply <laughs> forgot. To do. Human error. It is a fantastic error, system. Yeah. I, you know, I encourage everyone to have a look at it. Uh, have a look at Flock. It's a, it's Ooh, a brilliant sorry, example, sorry. isn't it? And really useful as well. Sorry, because if they look for Flock, Flock's another software system, and I'll get told off. So it's your Flock. So it's your Flock. The code UK. Not call it UK. Flock, yeah. I'll get. I will be told off by not an AI system. I'll be told off by a human being. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, well, th thanks, thanks so much. So much. And uh, for those of you just with us still, we have another session in a couple of weeks on the 31st of March with Wasim Ahmed, who will be talking about social media and misinformation, 2 p.m. as always. So thank you again, Dan. Good to see you, Alex. And we're going to sign off. Great to see you guys. See ya. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.